Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Maybe you have joined us before. And if so, you know that we are making a quick trip through the Bible and we're getting way down towards the end in the book of Hebrews. There's an interesting spot in Hebrews that tells us something, and I just wonder if you really understand it. Go to Hebrews, turn to Hebrews 11 in your Bible. Let's start with verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of of things not seen, for by it the elders obtain good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Then let's go down to verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'm sure those first three verses are perfectly clear to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How do we get from substance mm -hmm. that you can touch, feel, and smell of things hoped for? Mm -hmm not around. Mm -hmm. Evidence, something that you can have witnessed. Take a hold of. <clears throat> of things not seen. Mm -hmm. What if you tried to bring that kind of evidence into a court of law? Judge, I have some evidence. What did you see? Oh, nothing. I haven't seen it yet. There you go. How would that, how do we make sense of this? Okay, well, of course, we're talking about faith. That's a spiritual dimension to life, and it doesn't always measure up to exactly the same standards that other things, or, or it, let's say it, it's measured by a different uh, criteria than some other things are. Um, the, the people who translated our King James Bible struggled with this verse. They weren't sure what to do with it, because there was a couple words in here. They weren't sure what they really meant or what, the, how, what they were supposed to imply. So they came to the first word, and it's, it's a, a Greek word, hypostasis, the word for substance. And it's made up of two parts, hypo, or hypo, we would transliterate into English, and stasis, which means standing. Well, in, in, in Latin, hypo is, means under. In Latin, it would be sub, and stasis means standing, and Latin is stance. So they said, well, let's put it in Latin. Maybe people know what that means. <laughs> so they translated substance. Um, now, obviously, substance has come to have a very different meaning in our day. It means something you can get a hold of, something solid. But here, it means something that's standing under. What would that be? A foundation. Well, a foundation, possibly. Support. A support. That would, that's what you would be inclined to think. Um, it actually turns out that a couple hundred years after, 250 years after the King James was translated, people started digging around in the Middle East and particularly down in Egypt and so forth, and they would dig up these mummified cats and crocodiles and things like this, and they would be stuffed with bits of paper or ancient papyrus and so forth, and they pulled it out, and there were deeds of sale and all sorts of legal documents and so forth that people had no more use for. Now they, so they stuffed them into these animals. Well, it was a real boon for, for uh, people who were studying ancient languages because here's all this stuff with all these different words on it that had different kinds of meanings and they could gradually work it out. And it turns out that 
this word hypostasis was the word for a title deed. It meant, okay, I'm going to sell you something. We're not there right now. You can't actually take possession of it right now, but I'm going to give you title to this something, whatever it is. Okay, I sign it off. Here, you pay me the money. Okay, fine. I'm signing. Okay, it's yours. And that's a hypostasis. Now, what does that tell us about faith? Well, the verse says, faith is the substance, the, the title deed. Title. Huh? Go ahead. It's the title deed of something we hope for. Now, what would that mean? It's still just as confusing, isn't it? <laughs> or well, a, a, ti a title talks That's about right. something, something tangible. Yeah. It represents a well, piece of property out there, and you can go look at it. Well, yeah, exactly. So faith is our, our title deed to salvation in a heavenly kingdom. Is that real? Yeah, you bet it's real. I, may not con I can't show it to you right now, but it's real. Okay? Well, that's not all. The second half of the verse says, uh, depending on which translation you use, my translation says it means to be certain of the things we cannot see. And the word elenkos um, in the second half there is derived from a word which means um, something that the evidence, the proof of, the, um, the certainty, something like that of things. So faith then, what this verse really does, it doesn't tell us what faith is, it tells us what, fa tells us what faith does. Do we have confidence that God is able to deliver on his promises? That's the question. Do we, are we certain that God, if he promises something, can actually deliver? As I understand it, God is able to see the future. Mm -hmm. And as he looks down the future, he can see that as though it were today. Mm -hmm as though the future were in the present tense. Well, if he says, I will bring you up here mm -hmm. if you believe in me, mm -hmm. then he sees that as though it were present tense. <clears throat> yeah. And if he sees it that way, that gives me, I think I can buy into that. The Message Bible sort of expands on this verse, but I think does a good job. The fundamental fact, and we talked about the substance, the fundamental or the foundational fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It is our handle on what we can't see. <coughs> Excuse me. It is our handle on what we can't see. What well, does that there's, imply? There's there's a lot of things about truth, even, that um, you believe. I mean, if a person believes that, if a person's honest and truthful, mm -hmm. he believes that things will go better for him than if he's a liar and a cheater. Why? Okay, but, but yeah, that's, that's just it. Um, why? <laughs> yeah, why? That's the question. Why? But um, uh, I know why I believe that way, but... Um, I just well, believe that the truth will work out better than if you lied. Mm -hmm. um, maybe okay. it's because it's, I tried some things out. So now we have to go back to the question of faith. What is faith? How does it work? Where does it come from? What does it mean? Maybe then we can fit it into our little formula. Well, if it's such a, <clears throat> such a substantial thing, how is it that there are so many, so many people that seem to have all of this faith and they're misguided by it? Yeah. They, you know, they, they latch onto their faith and they believe, well, you know, and then they end up down in Guyana poisoning themselves or, yep. or following some knot-headed preacher, maybe even shows up in my church. Yeah. How? Well, the evidence has to fit the faith, don't you think? 
Um, if you you can have faith without evidence, and then you'll go crazy. I mean, <laughs> well, things okay. will go bad. Well, okay. Let's look at some, some kinds of evidence. If we look through the Bible, did God ever promise anything that he didn't deliver on? He doesn't well, come yet. Okay, but I mean, you know. There's some Old Testament prophecies that we scratch our heads over and maybe it's we just don't, they're, they're coming and we just don't understand them, but yeah. sometimes we say, well, they were, they're conditional prophecies. They were given for certain circumstances, under certain so, circumstances. Regarding what Gary just uh, mentioned, though, he hasn't promised that he would come yet. So he has fulfilled everything so far that he has promised. He hasn't promised that he isn't going to come to the Well, he's, time? he's given us a time, time frame, and he says that no man knows except the Father. But he did say he's going to come. He it's will come, a, but, he but, hasn't come there's, but certain things have to happen first, and those things have apparently happened. have not happened yet. Thus, thus he hasn't said anything still, that he, he hasn't, hasn't come yet. Yeah, but you see, and, and that's, that's the point. The reason this verse is there to say, okay, X number of things have been promised and they have happened. Okay, starting from here, there's still an X number of things that haven't happened yet. What are the chances that those things are going to happen? That's the question. You still, you still are using faith for the rest of the things. Okay, but and what is that faith based on? 100%. Based on what has come before. Yeah. So, and, and I, I would mention the, the words of Ellen White in Steps to Christ, page 105. God never asks us to believe, that is to have faith. Belief, faith, trust, uh, trust, confidence, those are all from the same Greek word. God never asks us to believe anything for which he does not provide adequate evidence. That's not overwhelming evidence, but adequate evidence. Okay? Now, um, or so, you sure have to look for that evidence sometimes. Well, I mean, what do we have time? I mean, what else do we do in this life? Well, there isn't there really. <laughs> lots of times there isn't any evidence against it yeah. either, and that helps. Well, so. it's, it's important we figure this out because Acts chapter 16 and verse 31 have the interesting words that Paul spoke to the Philippian jailer. They answered, Believe in the, this is Paul and Silas, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your family. So they said, Paul said, the only criteria, the only necessity, only necessity for salvation is faith. So we better figure out what this faith is. Gordon, you were going to comment. Uh, Jay had mentioned something, well, you'd asked, have any of the God's promises not come true? Well, God told Abraham, I'll give this land to your people forever, and to David, your, your family, you, you and your descendants will rule forever. Mm -hmm. I don't see the <laughs> family of David, well, the family of David only ruled for a short time. Are there any of the many members Christ. of the family of David still living? Yes, Christ Jesus. Absolutely. And he is ruling in heaven. And he will continue to and rule forever. he will forever. continue, yes. So are you exactly. trying to say that there were conditional prophecies or we misunder they could be misunderstood? Well, yeah, there's always a possibility someone can misunderstand. But so long as Christ is ruling and he's a descendant of David, although he's an ancestor of David too, we understand that problem, we can't say that prophecy hasn't been fulfilled. But there were a number of years, like 600 years in between the Babylonian captivity and Jesus where there wasn't a, a member of David's family on the throne. Yeah, on the throne, okay, if you, if you go by that, yeah. There were still members of David's family, because Jesus himself was born into David's family. Well, and once again, <clears throat> it could be our interpretation is... Is, is faulty. Is, is, is not quite... You know, that, that's the way we would interpret it, but God interprets it uh, Well, sometimes, sometimes I wonder about the word forever, if it has a different meaning to us now than it did back then. Yeah. Because forever back then could be as long as it takes. Mm -hmm. 
you know, as as right now, forever means it continues, continues, continues. Yeah, without stopping. Well, um, what we what we have seen, I hope, at least a little hint of, is that this verse in Hebrews eleven one actually tells us what faith does instead of what faith is. So now we have to determine what faith is. I would like to suggest this definition as, as originally compiled by a wonderful friend of mine by the name of Dr. A. Graham Maxwell. And he put it together in this way. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. It's a word to describe a relationship with God. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. We can't say will be because look at the example of Lucifer, turn to Satan. But the better the relationship may be if we choose to comply. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed. Remember our statements from Ellen White? to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we are sure he is the one saying it, to accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he is the one offering it, and to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. That is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith so then, also means, hold on, I'm not quite done, Faith also means that like Abraham and Moses, who we know God, who knew God well enough to reverently ask him, we know God well enough to reverently ask him, why? Yes, go ahead. Well, I lost my thought there. Sorry. <laughs> Don't you think, though, that faith is the beginning point of belief? You don't necessarily have a relationship yet, but... Um, you got to have a starting point where you actually decide whether to believe in God or not. I don't okay, think you. I don't think you ever come up with enough evidence to completely conclude that you'd be stupid if you don't. You need to. Um, there's there's a point where you have to make a decision one way or the other, just based on all the evidence that go for it and all the evidence that go against it. Okay, let's let's talk about the huge discussion that this is created in, in, in theological circles down through the generations. And I'll, I'll, try to post the uh, I'll try to pose the question as clear as I can, and we're not going to solve it because obviously people have been arguing about it for hundreds of years, but at least let's let, try to understand the question. Some people consider, well, <clears throat> we're saying, okay, here's the evidence that's stacking up here like this, and at a certain point you say, well, yes, I trust that evidence, I make a decision. Some people call that making a decision, the leap of faith. Now, you can focus on two parts to that picture, if you think about it. One is, do you have enough evidence piling up here to be reasonably certain, maybe even more than reasonably certain, that when you make the next step, it's going to be okay? Or do you say, well, I don't know anything, I'm not sure about any of this stuff, so now all of a sudden I'm standing on this cliff, and I close my eyes and I make a giant leap. And that's the difference. The people who aren't sure about faith, they're the ones that are standing there with their eyes closed. And the people who are sure about their faith are the ones who have checked it out all the way along. And they said, yes, God, yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. You're reliable. I can trust you. So now as I make that next step, I have the full confidence. Hebrews 11.1. 1. I have, I'm certainty. I have the full confidence that when you tell me to do it, it's the right thing to do. So, it, oh, it's, it's... Aren't you... Isn't there an issue of resolution here? I mean, I'm talking about, like, picture resolution, mm -hmm. where you you get smaller and smaller, you know. How, how deep do you go before you feel like you've crossed that line where you've been um, convinced mm -hmm. one way or the other? I don't know if that line ever comes. There's just a point where, where you're going to have to make a decision. Yeah. And each person might be different yes. where that line Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that decision there, um, 
to make the decision really stick, you got to have faith to to make well, it no, stick. Well, no, no, no. You have at at a certain point, you have to decide. Okay, I'm going to trust God, or I'm not going to trust God. You have to make that decision. But that's and, right. But, and you but can, when you you still have to make a decision on whatever you, you you make. Right. And so when you make that decision, then you have faith in that decision, whether it's wrong, Hopefully. right, or right. I don't know. I think. I think the problem mostly here is definition of what faith is. Some people don't. I mean, you've got a definition. Graham Maxwell has a definition, but it may not be a definition that everybody agrees with. That's fine. And, and the guys who are standing there on the edge of the cliff with their eyes shut are going to have a different definition. Well, I'm not willing. I'm, I'm, not, not, I'm not saying that. That I'm not every willing time to go with them. Have, I'm not saying that a definition, you're either going to have a good definition where you don't have your eyes closed or you have a definition where you do have well, your eyes closed. Well, but it's, it's more than that. Remember, the, the people who stand on the edge of that cliff with their eyes closed are really the people who, who have doubted every step along the way, and they're not sure about the path that led up to there. And God says, you don't need to be climbing this ladder with doubts at every step. Let me show you, bang, 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 as you go up here. There is enough evidence. If you say there's not enough evidence, then you're directly denying the truth of God's Word. Those, those bang, bang, bang steps that you were talking about could be like Job, God sets the world sure. upon nothing, biological facts, geological facts, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, this sounds like you really don't need any faith. You gather enough evidence, and there's enough evidence... So then your faith is, uh, you've got confidence in the evidence. And that's what faith is. <clears throat> confidence Isn't in the evidence. Ah, I'm not yeah, sure. Is. But, but because Absolutely. God is so much bigger, and, and we do have that faith, that is the confidence. That's, that is the faith. Let's bring up the family situation. It's not, I'm not talking about an extreme. I'm talking about a, a healthy family, not a dysfunctional one. But a child is born into that family. The father interacts with it. The mother interacts with it. That child, on the basis of that nurture, on the basis of what the father and the mother have done for the child, they have seen that. They, those little fellas, they said, my daddy is number yep. one, mm -hmm. based on the evidence that they have had with their father. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what what God is asking for us, to have that enough relationship with Him that we can say, my God is number one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. There's an awful There's lot no of people two. whose lives have a lot of evidence to, to causes them to doubt God. Well, Their lives have been okay, but in, bad. Their interpretation of that evidence. If, but if you, if you, if you take yes. that approach, and if you, if you, you have that question, then you, you, you need to say to them, okay, lay out your evidence. Let's look at it. We'll lay out our evidence for the biblical picture. Which one do we trust? And that's the question. And it is a choice. And it is a choice. That's all it is, is a choice. It, who, so, yeah. so who had more sorry. reason to doubt God than Job when he'd lost it, you know, lost all, all his family one by one, all his possessions one by one, or in great bunches? And yet, who trusted God, who had faith in God more than Job? Yeah, and, and all the evidence seemed to indicate that he shouldn't trust. Uh, but you see, that's, oh, that's what the problem no. is. That's what the problem is, because if you go back to, this is the part that people miss. Go to chapter 29 to 31 of the book of Job, and you'll read why Job trusted God. He had lots of evidence. It, we just don't, it's just not spelled out in the book. He talks about what happened to him back before the Job book happened, the, the information that we have in that book. It's that that his, base, his trust was. And he says, God, why aren't you talking to me now like you used to, etc.? That was the basis for his trusting God, not the basis on which, not the basis of, of just the story as we have it. If, if there was nothing to Job's life except the story we have, then there would be a problem. Well, it sounds then like well, we don't want to get too far into Job, but it sounds like what Job was doing was basing his faith on evidence previously, and now he's got all this other evidence, and he's just discarding that. No, he's saying, I have 
enough faith based on my previous experiences with God that when a few bumps in the road come along, they may be pretty big bumps, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lose my faith in God. Well, there wasn't any there wasn't any evidence to disregard what happened to him before, but um, but you know even though the tough stuff was coming, um, he still didn't have anything coming up that would disallow deny. this stuff. Yeah, deny what though, before. Though he slay me, still I will follow. Yeah. So in regards to faith, <clears throat> there's no really risk involved. You don't just well, launch out on faith. If, 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 well, if there is a risk involved, and here's the risk. <clears throat> the risk is if the person who says, I don't need to check out the evidence. I don't need to bother with finding out everything. I'm going to charge up this hill. I may not have a clue what the hill is ba based on. I haven't checked out the evidence. But when I get to the top, I'm going to say, well, here I am. Close my eyes and jump. And I'll, that's what a lot of people are doing. They, it's too much trouble for them to check out the evidence. They're not, they don't have time to study the Bible. They don't have to, time to see what God has done in the past. They just get up the top and they say, well, I choose to trust God or I choose not to trust God. Whoopee! And here I go. The, the fallen angels, mm -hmm. did they not have misplaced, misplaced faith? Mm -hmm. They had evidence but then uh, Lucifer had been their uh, mentor. He had talked to them. He had done them favors, I saw. At least they, they had that kind of friendly relationship. Mm -hmm. And he came with his ideas. And they transferred their faith, f just like Adam and Eve did, from their creator, their maker, one to Satan, the other to the creature in the tree. When do, when do you know that you've got enough faith? I mean, enough evidence? Because you never have all the evidence. Well, that's how do you know enough, when you make the enough decision. to make the you choice? Make <laughs> when you decide to make the choice, that's enough for you. Yes. It may not be enough for somebody else. It may be too much for somebody else. Now we're back to Ken's guys jumping off the cliff. Okay, Look at well. The thief on the cross. And, and they're, they're not the only ones because we need to look at the end of Hebrews 11 and we find some incredible stuff there. It was, it was faith that made the Israelites, I'm starting from verse 29, it was faith that made the Israelites able to cross the Red Sea as if on dry land. They all had lots of faith. <laughs> when the, <laughs> Enough to go. <laughs> Where, where's, where's the evidence there? Well, ah, 40 years them, the about three days before, they were slaves. Not, not only that, <laughs> what happened to the ten plagues? Yeah. Was that yeah. some evidence? I think the evidence they had was Pharaoh was on their tail. That's what I think. <laughs> and Ken, what, what do you think? What do you think well, the time that's evidence was <laughs> of those plagues. The less than what, a year for sure. Less than a year. So they were going through this. They saw it all. Mm -hmm. And and Pharaoh let them go. Yeah. Yeah, but well, well, but they they failed in a lot of other places well, they failed, too, they and you wonder why step. they did. They failed every because step. they've seen all this stuff and right. they still failed. So, but the incredible thing is, if you read on here, it says Rahab had faith, and who else had faith? Gideon, <laughs> Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Through faith, they fought whole countries and won. They did what was right and received what God had promised. They shut the mouths of lions and it goes on and on and on and on. So what is it saying that these people, and think of their stories, by this time in the Bible you should have the whole rest of the book memorized, right? <laughs> at least you should be familiar with those stories and you should be able to say, look at the relatively tiny bit of evidence that they had, and yet they were able to trust God based on that evidence. How much evidence do we have can we trust God based on the evidence that we have? Stick around, we'll discuss that.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. So what about that faith business? Is that something we can actually manage? Do we, can we do it? Is it too difficult? Well, those people in the Old Testament had a whole lot less evidence than we have. We have so much, I mean, and look at here, I mean, I can pick up the entire scriptures in, in a book, and now this is a, a study Bible, so it's got a lot of extra stuff in it. Here it is right here, and it's in a language that I can easily understand, and it's spread out in front of me. Uh, I didn't have to pay an arm and a leg to, to buy it. I can get it for relatively cheap. And those people, what did they have? I mean, Job had no Bible, no pastor, no church, no supporting group that told him what to do and so forth like this. What did he have? He had personal communication with yeah. God. He talked with God. Face to face. Exactly. Or at least voice to voice. Yes. So, where does that leave us? Are we, are we, le are we worse off because God is not speaking to us personally like that, voice to voice, even though we've got all of this evidence? Are we better off with all the evidence as opposed to the talking with voice to voice. We might be better off with all the evidence. Why? We're cut, we're cut a little bit of slack, I think, by if we saw God face to face, and if we fell away, I don't mean fall away completely, I mean, you know, in our daily struggles, not live up to having seen God face to face. By not having seen Him face to face, we're just going by his words in here, and that's a lot of faith. And I think God recognizes that. But like you said, he gives us ample evidence, and I suggest anyone that reads the Bible prayerfully, I believe that they can find that faith also. Here's the, here's the challenge. If you, suppose, I mean, if I had asked most of you without, if you didn't have time to stop and think about my, my question, if I said, how would you like to spend half an hour a week with God face to face? You would say, right on, I'd love it. As long as I knew it was him. As long as I know it's him. Yeah, you've got to know. You've got to have the evidence. Okay, because if you said, okay, I'd like to spend half an hour week with God, guess who would demand equal time? Satan. How would you like to spend half an hour a week with, faith, with Satan face to face? Do you have a choice? <laughs> <laughs> I... I think that we live in a world where Satan has plenty of access to us. Uh, we could have that half hour with God, and Satan's already got his part. Yeah. I mean, it's up to God to decide where the where where freedom of choice is is disbanded or violated. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that that we should say that because. Satan might ask for equal time is not a, a reason to say if that we had the right relationship with God, we might well have face-to-face -face talk. I, I'm, I'm saying that we better base our faith on this evidence we have, oh, and we sure. better study it, because the day is coming when that's going to happen to us. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'd like to move on. Uh, we, we do need to move on. Look at chapter, the first few verses in chapter 12 of Hebrews. As for us, we have this large crowd of witnesses around us. And guess who he's talking about? All, All these people who evidence the faith, right? So then, let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and of the sin which holds on to us tightly, and let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. Does that give you a clue? He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him. And what's that joy, by the way? Salvation. No, the or joy the of seeing his people redeemed. The joy of seeing you and me in his heavenly kingdom. That's what he was looking forward to. He is now seated at the right, uh, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross, and he is now seated at the right side of God's throne. Think of what he went through. How he put up with so much hatred from sinners. So do not let yourselves become discouraged and give up. For in your struggle against sin, you have not yet had to resist to the point of being killed. Now, your point, Norm. Have you forgotten the encouraging words which God speaks to you as his children? My child, pay attention when the Lord corrects you, and do not be discouraged when he rebukes you. 
because the Lord corrects everyone he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as a child. Endure what you suffer as being a father's punishment. Your suffering shows that God is treating you as his children. Was there ever a child who was not punished by his father? If you're not punished, as all his children are, it means you're not real children but bastards. So who do you want to be? What does that really mean? What that means is, if you refuse to accept any discipline from God, you have rejected him as your father. Is that fun? <laughs> well, it's, there's not a question well, of whether it's fun. It, it's a question it's, of what's the right thing to do. Maybe it's um, kind of like boot camp. A little? With, uh, what do you mean? With, with the Marines or something. <laughs> Some people love that. I mean, they, they go in that and they just can't wait to go through that kind of discipline. And the drill sergeant uh, and, drives and them down until they stop loving it. Well, in a way, to break them. I think they go through it because they know the kind of person they're going to come out to be at the end. Yes. So How about substituting the word instead of uh, um, punish it, use discipline? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what, if God just right. beating out punishment, what's the purpose of it? Mm -hmm. If a person is just venting their, their anger on their kids or, who, or their students or whatever, it might, what's the purpose of it? Yeah. It's the purpose is to train yeah. Students or trained children, yeah. how to live. Discipline, Discipline, correction. To make disciples. Yes. It goes on to say that. In the case of our human fathers, they punished us as we respect, and we respected them. How much more then should we submit to our spiritual father and live? Our human fathers punished us for a short time as it seemed right to them, but God does it for our own good. Notice that, for our own good so that we may share his holiness. When we are punished, it seems to us at the time something to make us sad, not glad. Later, however, those who have been dis disciplined, there's your word, disciplined, by such punishment, reap the peaceful reward of a righteous what life. Kind of, what kind of discipline are we talking about here? Whatever it takes. Kind of pus well, punishment or Job discipline? Job would like to or? describe to you about his discipline, uh, you know, and a lot of others. I mean, look at what Jesus went through. Job's, Job's experience wasn't something he deserved. No. And it really wasn't probably anything he needed for his life because he was on very good terms with God. And, of course, Jesus <laughs> suffered, and not for any purpose other than to show us how evil works. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't, my perception is Job is not receiving, his hard times are not deceiving, are not receiving punishment or discipline, that, that Satan was turned loose on him. Yeah. I'm not sure Job, do you Job's think, experience fits here. Do you any, how do you think any discipline gets turned loose? So now wait a minute here. Well, if you're saying that God is doing the discipline and then the way he disciplines is turns Satan loose on us, that something's wrong. How did he discipline Israel? He turned Babylon, Babylon loose on him. Well, I'm not sure I'm ready. <laughs> one thing, though. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> well, it, well, that wasn't something that needed to happen, though. Uh, that's something that needed to happen after what they did. Okay. So, but, but I wonder about this word punishment. Um, that's, that's a word that the translators picked, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I'm, I can't kind of think about guys that come back from a fitness camp or something they said well how was it well man we really got punished man we it was great you know uh, using those kind of words and we kind of know what they mean but they were, sometimes they were i wonder and they developed discipline I, I mean these guys talk about the push-ups they do the sit-ups the pull-ups man they say they got they were really it was a punishment man <laughs> well, yeah, because that's it how it felt it felt awful yeah. Their body cried with pain. Yeah. And that's what punishment well, why feels they, like. Why and do they come back with a smile when they say it? Because they weren't doing it at the time. They <laughs> it's were like smiling. climbing Mount Everest. It was, <laughs> it, that part of it was finished. To because yeah. something they to look back on the and they experience. Grew. They grew through this exercise, through this discipline, yeah. through mm -hmm. this boot camp. Okay, now, now, now the author of Hebrews is going to give us our test case. Are you ready? We get to the end of chapter 12, and it says, Let us be, reading? I'm reading, starting with verse 28 of Hebrews 12. Let us be thankful then, because we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So these guys who came back from boot camp, they, they've got it together, right? 
a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be grateful and worship God in a way that will please him with reverence and awe because our God is indeed a destroying fire. Now you want to put your arms around him and give him a big hug. The message <laughs> says it a bit, bit different. Okay. It says, um, God is not a, an indifferent... Uh, yeah, i just trying to get to the right place here. God is not an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn. He won't quit until it's all cleansed. God himself is fire. Hmm. Okay. So, yes, I would... Does that make you want to, lo want to love him? Yes, and I would like to go out there and give him a big hug as consuming fire, provided I'm wearing my fire suit, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, my... I don't know. I don't remember any verse that promises that Jesus will be a fire suit. <laughs> Is the, the clothing well, of righteousness. There's a lot of was, armor and stuff that, that things get associated with. It's, it's I don't like know what a it was fire suit. That Jesus did with the three worthies that were thrown into the, into the fire. In the but, they Daniel, went, yes. but they went walking around in there and they came out and didn't even smell like smoke. Yep. Only the ropes burned off of their hands. And, yeah. and the king said, looks like a fourth one in there. Mm -hmm. Don't think they were worried about the fire at that point. No. In my Bible, I have the handwritten note of Isaiah 33, 10 to 16 yeah. next to that uh, verse. Would you like to read that one to us? Well, how much of it do you want me to read? Well, read at least four. Uh, I would say read all of it. Let's, let's take the okay. time to read all of it. Isaiah 33, 10 through uh, 16. The Lord says to the nations, Now I will act. I will show how powerful I am. You make worthless plans, and everything you do is useless. My spirit is like a fire that will destroy you. You will crumble like rocks burned to make lime, like thorns burned to ashes. Let everyone near and far hear what I have done and acknowledge my power. The sinful people of Zion are trembling with fright. They say God's judgment is like a fire that burns forever. Can any of us survive a fire like that? You can survive if you say and do what is right. Don't use your power to cheat the poor and don't accept bribes. Don't join with those who plan to commit murder or to do other evil things. Then you will be safe. You will be as secure as if in a strong fortress. You will have food to eat and water to drink. So what is the suit that they're wearing? Righteousness. God. Righteousness. The sinners are the ones who are consumed, but the righteous are fine. They survive. What, what, what kind of fire is it that burns only sinners? It's kind of like the sun that melts the butter and bakes the clay. I see. So it depends upon what, what the but person is made of. It depends what you're made of, what happens to you in that fire, or in, that okay. presence, in the presence of that righteousness. But how do you feel about the fact that God is a fire? God's a destroying fire. How does that make you feel? An all-consuming fire. Yes. You know, I don't know what's so great about somebody burning people to a crisp. <laughs> I mean, what's so... <laughs> Well, okay. Unless you're the Let unless me. you're the French fry. Yeah, but still, I mean, burning anybody at a crisp. But what's so great about that? I'm I'm looking at real fire. They're doing that, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if the fire is that they're talking about is something a little different than than let, the fire that we let's see. Be, in a, let's be real practical about this. Someday, God is going to be faced with the challenge. Faced with challenges, lots of challenges along the way, but some days going to be faced with a great big challenge. He has to either eliminate all the evil or allow some of it to persist. Now, we don't think there's going to be any problem with him allowing the righteous to persist, right? That's not a problem. The question, the challenge is, how does he deal with the wicked? Now, if you're one of those righteous who's planning to live forever in a remade earth like the Garden of Eden, how much evil would you like God to leave? Zero. Okay. Would you like him to be a consuming fire? 
Yes, and he is. And he is. So I'll give him a gun so he blows these guys away. And he's and, <laughs> and that's what it sounds like. He's not doing that though. He is a consuming fire. Those who are not protected by righteousness through his son Jesus Christ, they're just burned up. Like Moses looked at the tailing at the trailing garments of God and then he his face shone so much that the Israelites were afraid of him. It's a little bit like this story I heard a long time ago about the Amish. Um, and I don't know if this is a true story or not, but the story goes like this, that a thief came to the house of one of the Amish and he had a gun and he was, he was getting ready to shoot the family so he could steal stuff from the house. And out came this Amish guy with his gun and he points at the guy and he says, I would not, for the, do, I would not do thee any harm for the world, but I'm about to shoot where thou art standing. <laughs> so, so that's the way, that's, the way, that's the way it is with God. He says, I have given every, I have made every possible provision for you to be saved. There is absolutely nothing more that the God of the universe can do to, to straighten things up for you. But if you're still determined to stand in the line of fire, that's what's going to happen. Considering human freedom. Mm -hmm. I've done every, God has done everything yep. without forcing you to make a specific decision. Yeah. Is there something, I seem to remember something about a, a fire within? Mm -hmm. If you go back to uh, Ezekiel 28, it talks about Satan being destroyed by a fire from within. From within. Yeah. Now that's, that's not lava type heat fire, no. that's, that's something else. Mm -hmm. And if that's the way that they're going to go, then we shouldn't probably be talking about heat and worrying about it. Well, and, and let me just give you the other side of the picture. We have First, I mean, First John four, verses eight and sixteen that say God is love. We have Romans thirteen eight and ten that says love is the fulfilling of all law. We have First Corinthians thirteen that describes love in great detail, and God is supposed to be the perfect example of all that, and yet he's a consuming fire. Can we put that together? Is it possible that all these sinners will come to a point where they will want to check out? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that, wouldn't that be the answer? I don't know how in the world it's going to get to that point, but um, the Bible says it's going to get to that Many point. Many of them will get to that point through fear. Just die from the fear no, I don't of think, seeing the I Lord don't come think, back. No, I, 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 I think, think I think that the answer to that is uh, Ellen White spells out out in considerable detail. Great controversy page, I believe it's six sixty four to six six sixty six might go on to six sixty seven, and she says that basically God is going to produce a panorama in the sky, and she, he's he's going to show us from the very beginning of evil in heaven all the way through, step by step by step by step, all the way through to the end. And everybody's going to watch it. Every single one of us is going to see that. Every one of us, some from inside the city and others from outside the city. And when that story is finished, the evidence is going to be so compelling that the people outside the city say, we, we just destroyed ourselves. We completely blew it. We had all the evidence was spread out before us and we rejected it. There's no reason for us to live anymore and God says, okay. And he allows them to, to perish. And Based that's, on and that's the second death. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. second death. What what, what if they, isn't there, the isn't there a preparation for war after that time? Well, the preparation for war becomes before that time. Then there, just as, there, as the wicked are attack, uh, attra I mean, uh, uh, prepare, attacking, is the word I want, attacking the, the New Jerusalem, or ready to attack the New Jerusalem, God lifts the New Jerusalem up off of the surface of the earth, according to the writings of Ellen White. And then there's this big panorama. And the, the armies who are getting ready to attack and blast their weapons at the New Jerusalem and so forth are halted. And everybody stand there, we're just transfixed watching this whole story. And when this panorama is finished, what do they do? Everybody kneels down and they say, God, this is Philippians 2, God, you did everything you possibly could. Then they suddenly realize, hey, some of them realize, hey, but we're outside the city 
And then their, their next question is, well, who got us here? Well, it was our pastors who misled us. It was the devil himself. And the whole evil world would turn around and be ready to attack Satan. That's, that's what's going to happen. Malachi 4, yes. 1 says, The day is coming when all proud and evil people will burn like straw. Mm -hmm. uh, straw is dead. Mm -hmm. I think people will be dead when they burn. When, if, if, if Jesus died the death, like the death of sinners, he didn't burn. No. He died. He was given up. He was unplugged from the ventilator for a time. Yeah. And then the fire as in Malachi 4, will come and clean up the mess. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So people die. This is not a case of... See, if you, if you teach the idea that there's going to be some long-term fire, even longer than a few seconds, what you have to... You, you, you've, got, you've got a problem because the Bible says, 2 Peter 3, that the, the, the glory of God is, is, is so hot, so so much of a fire that consumes the elements. That's a nuclear heat. A nuclear, that's an atomic bomb. Now, if you, if you say God is a consuming fire, he's like a nuclear explosion going off, how long does it take for a nuclear explosion to consume someone? Instantaneous. Inst they never even know what hit them. Bam, it's gone. Okay. If that's the case, and then you say, well, no, but God is going to punish the wicked. They, everyone has to punish a certain, have to be punished a certain period of time. You've got two choices in, in that. One choice is that God turns his fire down and makes it just, just way down, just hot enough so you have to burn. And really, I mean, if God is operating a blowtorch, I don't want to have anything to do with him. I don't want to have anything to do with him because he's not, I, I absolutely do not believe that God was operating a blowtorch. Or the other option is he, he, he puts asbestos suits on all the wicked, which is just as foolish. You know, it's crazy. So you, you can't have that kind of an approach. If God is a consuming fire, that he's nuclear hot, then you have to say, okay, any kind of torture or punishment is mental torture or punishment, and it happens before t God turns loose his fire. And we are talking about the second death. Yes. Thus, it's a death. Mm -hmm. So they will not be alive. But, but do we really have to go that direction where you have, to, you have to solve people getting thrown in the fire alive and be burned, and you just fix it by just making it so f quick that they don't feel anything? Mm -hmm. I just wonder if the, the fire is just their... their um, their pain being in, in an environment that they no longer can take, no, that they can't stand. The Bible des describes that very well, and I, and I went... Well, I, I read should, the Bible. I should I'm have gotten to... to I should I'm have trying, gotten, to, trying to see where you're getting all I this. I should have gotten to the last step, and that's found in Isaiah 66, verse 24. It says, what is consumed by that fire at the end is dead bodies. Well, that's they're true. Con they're dead. By the time God's fire turns loose, these people are already dead. Well, yeah. That's I why I... That. I mean, it's just like, what do you do with the bodies? You've got to get rid of them somehow. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's a big thing. But God, I'm wondering God's about this consuming stuff and why it's, why it's uncomfortable. I mean, I remember in third grade, I got transferred to a, to a room that I hated because I didn't like the way the teacher was doing things and, and you know, having naps and doing all these parades that you do around like some teachers do. I just hated it. I told mom I just didn't like it anymore. It was just, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to get out of there. And so she went to the president principal and got me back to the other place. Mm -hmm. But uh, my illustration there is, is that these sinners are going to get into a place that they really hate mm -hmm. and they know there's no other place to go. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, that's where I think they would want to check out. Yeah. Yeah. Well. In Zenophile uh, chapter 3, it says, So now the Lord says, Be patient. The time is coming soon when I will stand up and accuse these evil nations. For it is my decision to gather together the kingdoms of the earth and pour out my fiercest anger and fury on them. 
all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my jealousy. Mm -hmm. On that day I will purify the lips of all people so that everyone will be able to worship the Lord together. My scattered people who live beyond the rivers of Ethiopia will come to present their offerings. Yeah. Okay. Why? I did, it's, it's... Yeah, I, there's more than one place in the Bible that talks about this. By the way, in case you would like to look at some of the materials we've been talking about, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So, Ken, what have we learned from this section of Hebrews? Well, what have we learned in, about God? In, in this section of Hebrews, we have learned that God, in order to save people, has to have, has to develop between himself and them a trusting relationship. A relationship that actually transforms those people into the kind of people that it's safe to admit to heaven. And if they are those kind of people, when God admits them to heaven, then heaven is safe. He cannot admit to heaven people who don't meet that criteria. And then he goes on in chapters 12 and 13 and he talks about how those kinds of people are developed. They're developed through discipline. They may have to face some difficulties. You know, something of value is something that, you know, that you spend time developing, you, you, you spend time working on. Uh, children don't start off perfect. You know, we might think those beautiful little bundle is perfect, but it has a ways to go before it becomes a mature adult. It takes time. And that's basically what this part of the, of the book of Hebrews said. It says God, in, in chapter, starting with chapter 1 through chapter 10, God has said, let me explain to you about my plan of salvation. Here's Jesus. He's superior to angels. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to, to the, old, whole, old, the whole Old Testament sacrificial system and the high priests, the priests and high priests of that system. He's superior to, well, he's in the line of Melchizedek. And then he goes on and says, but all that stuff was really just a faint shadow of what I really have in, in mind for you. It's something glorious. And what is that something glorious? I'm hoping that I can have a personal relationship with every one of you, a kind of relationship that will transform your lives, that will be built on solid evidence that you can say, though he slay me, I will trust him, as Job said. And if we have that kind of relationship with God, there's nothing for us to fear. We can move forward with God holding our hand and be perfectly confident that what's ahead is safe and that God will show us through. See you next week.